Okay, I think we can start. Good morning. Welcome back. Uh, let us continue with our quantization of free fields. In the last lectures, lectures we discussed the real Klein-Gordon field. And uh, today we will continue with the complex Klein-Gordon field or the complex scalar field. But before we go there, let us remind ourselves of two results that we already had. Namely, at the very beginning of the lecture, we discussed a non-relativistic case of a so-called Schrödinger field. And uh, there we obtained a, a field operator, which consisted of these creation and annihilation operators, but simply in this way, where it contained only an annihilation operator, but no corresponding creation operator. And if you then write down phi dagger phi, a real combination, then a particle number is not changed, but particle number is automatically conserved. And that was the non-relativistic case. In the, uh, com uh, in the relativistic case, where we discussed the spin zero Klein-Gordon scalar field, we obtained a similar representation. But um, apart from this DP tilde measure, which uh, implements the Klein-Gordon equation, a decisive difference was this one. Namely, we needed to combine a creation and an annihilation operator uh, together in the same field operator. So if you now write down expressions like phi square, phi cube, phi to the fourth power, and so on, then inevitably there will be terms which change the number of particles. And so such a theory, a relativistic theory, will inevitably lead to interactions which uh, create particles or annihilate particles. And this uh, necessity arose in a very innocent looking way. Namely, simply we needed to make the field operator Hermitian and therefore, whenever you write down this, you also need to write down that. Otherwise, it's of course not Hermitian. So that looks a little bit uh, uninspiring. Why should uh, this important feature of particle creation um, come from uh, the reality of the fields? And today we will look at a complex field where uh, we do not have to make it Hermitian. And therefore, we will be interested in, in particular in seeing whether again such a structure arises or whether in the complex case we might get a result which is more similar to the non-relativistic Schrödinger field. So in other words, the question is, if we go from a real to a complex scalar field, do we still obtain the prediction of particle creation and annihilation or does this prediction, um, is, is it restricted to the real case? Okay. And so therefore, let us discuss this. Let us consider a complex scalar field phi, which is different from phi star in the classical level. And write down again the simplest Lorentz invariant Lagrangian. which is uh, real, so the Lagrangian should be real and should be Lorentz invariant and the simplest means that we get linear equations of motion, so the Lagrangian should be quadratic in the field. And so there are now uh, two terms which we can write down, one with a derivative and a mass term and the terms look very similar to the real case. But instead of having the real derivative d mu phi square times one half, we simply have d mu phi star times d mu phi. This is then automatically real and it's also automatically Lorentz invariant because that is a scalar field. And then we add minus m square times phi star phi. This is a mass term which again is very similar to the real mass term, but it involves phi star phi and therefore this is real. And uh, the question that we ask is the same as the last time, namely what is the corresponding quantum theory and we could go in this identical sequence of steps as we did for the real case 
um, but we will not do it here in the lecture. You uh, are welcome to do it at home or read about it in any number of quantum field theory books because that is of course standard. But we will highlight here the key differences between the complex case and the real case and in particular highlight whether we get in the complex uh, relativistic case something which is more similar to that one or something that is more similar to that one. That is the main question that I want to answer here. And so let us start with this, with the main differences to the real case, real scalar. And so let me write down the main question. So in words, the question that I posed before is now, can we write down a field operator phi hat of x? It's just the left half of our real field operator where we only have an operator A instead of A dagger. Because it looks like maybe that should be sufficient since the only thing that, that changes is the field operator doesn't have to be Hermitian anymore. So let's just drop that and uh, then we are happy and our field operator satisfies everything it should satisfy. So is that possible? And if yes, then we could have here a relativistic theory without particle uh, number changes, because then we would just write down phi dagger phi everywhere and the particle number would be conserved. And the answer to this question is no, we cannot. And uh, why is the answer no? You already know it because that was our very first lecture in the semester. We saw by very simple arguments that in a relativistic quantum field theory, for sure it cannot be that a relativistic quantum theory is a single particle theory with no particle creation and annihilation processes. Such a theory just doesn't make sense for very simple reasons. And therefore the answer must be no, okay? But why is it actually no? And so let me give you two uh, concrete answers which explain in two different ways why the answer is no. And the first answer is um, maybe not an intuitive answer but a very very simple minded reason. Namely you can immediately say the answer cannot be yes, the answer must be no because our complex case can be immediately converted into the real case in a very simple way. Therefore, the physics of the complex case cannot be different from the physics of the real case. So how can we convert this? So the theory is equivalent to the following. Simply write phi is equal to phi a plus i phi b over square root of two, where phi a and b are real, okay? So you can decompose a complex number into two real numbers as usually, real and imaginary parts. And if we do that and plug it into the Lagrangian, then the Lagrangian very simply becomes the following. It becomes real part square plus imaginary part square times one half. So we get this. So we get simply two lines of terms, one term with phi a and the identical term with phi b. And both of those terms look identically to the terms in the real scalar field case, right? And therefore this phi a behaves exactly like the real scalar from before and phi b also behaves identical to the real scalar from before. So in both cases we get particle creation and annihilation and we get field <coughs> operators 
which have this general structure on the left of the blackboard. So that tells you the answer cannot be uh, that this is possible. It must be impossible. So it's then also clear phi A and phi B, they, each of them describes one type of a particle, but there are two fields, phi A and phi B. So the theory describes two different types of particles, let's say a particle type A and the second particle type B. And both of them behave in the way uh, of the real scalar particle from before. So the theory is equivalent to two independent real theories. And therefore it must describe two particle types. And both particle types must have the same mass. The rest mass is the same m in both cases because the same m appears in both both lines of the Lagrangian. Okay, so uh, that's the answer and in, in principle we could therefore stop here and say we have completely understood our complex theory because we have traced it back to two real theories and we know the real theories. But you might want to understand a little bit more in detail how can it happen that uh, this simple-minded ansatz is impossible in our complex scalar field case? This answer here is too superficial. It tells us that it's impossible but doesn't really give us an explanation why it is impossible. And so let me uh, give you a second answer which might explain it in a little bit more detail. And the second answer is to simply follow the procedure. So you must now imagine that we do exactly the same things as we did in the past lectures for the real scalar field, step by step. We go through the cl <coughs> classical case, <coughs> then do canonical quantization and so on and so forth. And along the way, we meet the necessity to define canonical conjugate momenta pi. They are defined as dl by d phi. And that is now different from the real scalar case. So if we go back to the original version without phi a, phi b, but just use phi, then derivative with respect to phi dot gives us phi star dot. Phi star dot. Similarly, there is a pi star the canonical momentum for the start field, phi star, which is then phi dot without star. So there are two independent variables, phi and phi star, and two independent canonical momenta, pi and pi star, and they have this <coughs> behavior. Now, in the first weeks of our semester, we discussed a lot about the so-called constraints on the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian level. And here we do not have a constraint because our momenta are just defined by time derivatives of the original fields and that is no constraint. A constraint is something where the canonical momenta depend not on the time derivatives but on the fields themselves. And that was the case in the Schrödinger field at the very top. The Schrödinger field had such a constraint and pi was immediately given by psi, psi star or psi decker without time derivative. And that is the key difference between the relativistic case here with complex field and the non-relativistic Schrödinger field case with a complex uh, non-relativistic field. Because here we don't have a constraint, there we did have a constraint. And so that it then leads to very different commutation relations, namely here we would get without arguments just in the usual way phi hat with phi hat is zero but also phi hat with phi hat dagger 
that is also zero because this is simply the commutator between two different canonical variables. All the canonical variables commute among them and okay, just here to go on. However, what is not zero is the commutator between phi hat and pi hat. That is not zero, but that is by definition equal to commutator of phi dagger dot. That is not zero and that would give a three-dimensional delta function with the usual arguments. Okay, and uh, so on, there are a few more commutators, but these three are sufficient to see the key difference because in the Schrödinger field case, you had a commutator between Psi and Psi Decker. Psi Decker was the canonical momentum, and therefore in the Schrödinger case, Psi, Psi Decker commutator was non-zero. Here, Phi, Phi Decker is zero, but Phi, Phi Decker dot, that is non-zero. And this very different structure of the commutators, of course, explains why uh, that solution that I wrote down here as an ansatz was the correct solution in the Schrödinger case, but is not at all the correct solution in this case, because this will not satisfy those commutational relations here. So let us simply say this is different from the Schrödinger field case. That was section 1.2, and therefore it is not solved by the ansatz. Let's say the ansatz, let's call it star, it's not solved by star. And that here is our ansatz star. The main question, does star solve all our relationships? And the answer is no. And now you see also in some detail where the subtle difference comes in. Okay, that is what I wanted to explain you, why the field, the complex scalar field behaves, how it behaves. The physics is now clear. We describe two different particle types, A and B, with the same mass, and both of these particle types behave in the identical way to the case of last week. And uh, there is no possibility that we get back the simple result from the non-relativistic case because first of all, the equivalence to the phi A, phi B theory, and second, because this ansatz doesn't solve the changed commutational relations. But now, let me just jump to the final result for this case. If we would follow all the steps, then of course we would do all the details, and I will just write down the results um, after doing that. Because how you would do it is now quite clear, I think. So the correct ansatz would be for this phi A phi B, let's call it phi I in general, it's the same as in the real case dp tilde e to the minus i p x a i comma p plus e to the plus i p x a i p dagger and here the index i is either a or b and each of those a i of p behaves as before. Full stop. That would be it in principle, but we can bring it into a nicer but equivalent form. And that is then the usual form. Namely, we go back to the complex case. We undo this replacement and uh, consider really the full complex scalar field phi. 
And uh, of course, we can do that by forming the appropriate linear combinations. And then we get here a linear combination of the A's, which gives some complex A, and here a linear combination of the A deckers. And we give it a new name, which is the following. So we set dp tilde e to the minus ipx, and then just A of p without index i. That would be the linear combination uh, for the a a comma p plus i times a b comma p. Okay, so that would be this. But it's not important anymore where it comes from. The final result is what matters. So here we get a second operator which I call b, b decker of p. And uh, so the ansatz is now very simply and generically, we have um, an e to the minus ipx term with some annihilation operator and an e to the plus ipx term with some creation operator. And uh, this is not the Hermitian conjugate of that. They are just independent operators. And they come from the two different linear combinations of the a and b operators. But uh, we can forget about where it comes from. This is now the completely general and correct ansatz. And I wanted to write down the main properties this satisfies. So it satisfies, again, the Klein-Gordon equation on the operator level. And the operators satisfy certain obvious commutation relations, which I will just write down. Namely, A with A gives zero for all arguments, let's say P and P prime. That is zero, and the same is true for B with B. So each of these creation or annihilation operators satisfies this, then A with B decker is also zero. But A with A decker is not zero. That is not zero, and that is the same as B with B decker. Namely, the same as in the real case with this normalization 2 pi cubed times 2 p0 times a three dimensional delta function of the difference of the arguments. So this list shows you that uh, the creation and annihilation operate <coughs> A. <coughs> Sorry. A behave in the completely normal way, the Bs behave in the completely normal way, but they are independent. <coughs> Yeah, there is one missing. They are independent of each other. And so that again shows that we describe here two different types of particles, A and B, which are independent, but each of which behaves in the expected way. Let me write down a few more effects. Can also construct the representation of the Poincaré group, the operator p mu and j rho sigma, and then the full representation u of lambda a. Let's just say, obviously, similar to before. We can obtain explicit expressions in terms of the field operators, check the commutation relations, and then obtain that we get a unitary representation of the Poincaré group on our Hilbert space of states. What is our Hilbert space of states? A basis of states is given by the vacuum, which satisfies that it is annihilated by all A's and all B's. And then we have one particle states and multi-particle states.
So our one particle states are obtained if we act with A decker onto the vacuum. This gives a one particle state of particle type A. <coughs> or B decker onto the vacuum gives a one particle state of particle type B. And then we have all sorts of multi-particle states where we act with as many A daggers and B daggers onto the vacuum as we like. So each of these one particle types is a bosonic spin zero rest mass m particle as before and so we can in summary count the number of degrees of freedom like we did it in the last time Namely, our field has now two degrees of freedom because it is complex. So we have two field degrees of freedom. And we see here that this very nicely corresponds to two particle degrees of freedom. Namely, two different particle types, but each particle has been zero Therefore, each particle has only one degree of freedom. But so that matches. Okay, so that is the interpretation of the complex theory, but now comes an important additional point, which is the following. This complex theory, uh, the Lagrangian has been deleted, but the complex theory actually has an additional symmetry, which we have not yet talked about. So let's talk about this additional symmetry. And uh, it's a continuous symmetry, which leads to a conserved quantity, according to Noether's theorem. And so let's exhibit what the symmetry is and what the conserved quantity is. We can really call it a conserved charge here in this case. It might be electric charge or something similar. Namely, what is the symmetry? The Lagrangian is invariant under a phase transformation where phi goes to e to the i alpha times phi with an x independent alpha. Okay, it's a phase rotation. Noethers, uh, and it's obvious that the Lagrangian is invariant under the phase rotation because everywhere there appears phi star times phi. Uh, the phase is constant, so the derivatives do not change the phase, therefore it's, um, the Lagrangian is obviously invariant under this. Noether's theorem tells us then immediately that there is a conserved quantity, but in order to evaluate it, we need the infinitesimal form of the symmetry transformation. So we write that as phi plus i alpha times phi plus higher orders in alpha. And what is important for Noether's theorem is this infinitesimal shift, which there we often called delta phi. And similarly, since we treat phi and phi star as independent variables, we should also write down the infinitesimal shift for phi star. This goes into phi star minus i alpha phi star plus higher orders. And uh, then we can use this expression in Noether's theorem. So under this same symmetry, the Lagrangian stays invariant, L goes to L. So not even only the action is invariant, but even the Lagrangian itself is invariant. So that is a simplification compared to the previous cases, where we always had some Con, uh, additional term like d mu x mu. But this doesn't appear here. And then we can immediately copy our conserved current. Let us still uh, just copy it from the lecture. It was dl by d 
d rho phi times delta phi plus dl d d rho phi star <coughs> times delta phi star. So what is now the result of this uh, ansatz for the conserved quantity? So here dl by d rho phi gives us d rho with upper index phi star, okay, because that was the product in the kinetic term, times delta phi gives us times i alpha times phi. And here, the <coughs> derivative with respect to d rho phi star gives us d rho phi without star, and that is minus i alpha phi star. So if we factor out i times alpha, then we get the following, let's say phi times d rho phi star minus phi star d rho phi. And the term in brackets is our conserved current, which is independent of alpha. But actually, let us call it um, alpha times a conserved current, j rho. So the i is part of, so maybe I will write it like this. Then the term in square brackets is the conserved current. It uh, involves the i. And then we have here a conserved four current, which satisfies the continuity equation d rho j rho equal to zero. So this behaves exactly like electric charge. And we also get a full conserved overall charge Q, which is the d3x integral of the charge density J0, which is here d3x, then i times phi, phi dot beta minus, or phi star, minus i phi star, and this is a classical expression, but you can now turn it into a quantum expression by replacing the field fields by field operators. And uh, then, for example, phi dot here or phi dot uh, dagger is equal to the conjugate canonical momentum pi that we had defined before. And so you see that this is a non-trivial operator with non-trivial computational relations. And of course, you could again calculate the computational relations of this with uh, the field and with creation and annihilation operators and so on. And let me just give you the result because this calculation is quite easy. So you can compute that this operator Q, let me call it now Q hat on the quantum level, commutator with A decker of P, that gives you plus a decker of p and q hat with b decker of p gives you minus b decker of p. What does that tell you? It tells you something about the particles which are created by a decker and b decker, namely those particles are eigenstates of the charge operator. If you create something out of the vacuum then uh, and hit on it with q hat, then you get the same state times plus one. So the one particle state created by a decker is an eigenstate of q with eigenvalue plus one. The one particle state created by b decker is an eigenstate of q hat with eigenvalue minus one. So you will learn that first of all we have a conserved charge here and the two particle types have opposite charges. So how do you call it if you have two particle types which have the same rest mass and opposite charges? 
that is that are antiparticles. So we learn here that our theory automatically contains a pair of particles and antiparticles. So the particles A and B have charge plus or minus one. So they are a particle anti-particle uh, pair. And let me just summarize once again. Uh, the field operator combines A of P with B dagger of P. And now you see that this field operator either annihilates a particle with charge one or it creates an antiparticle with charge minus one. So whatever the field operator is doing, it always changes the charge by minus one unit. So the field operator behaves very homogeneously with respect to charges, but it can either create or annihilate particles, so particle number is not conserved, but the charge is conserved, and it can be conserved by either creating antiparticles or annihilating particles. So this is what we can learn from the complex scalar field. And so I would now stop the discussion of the complex scalar field and turn to our next topic, which is spinor fields. But do you have any questions to this topic here? Okay, so let us continue. <coughs> let us continue with the next topic, spin one half and Dirac fields. The Dirac fields, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Dirac spinors are the normal spinors that you are familiar with, which involve gamma matrices and are these four-component complex spinors. But in our logic, we shouldn't immediately start with dropping the Dirac spinors from the sky in the usual way, because we have the purpose of going through step by step all possible uh, types of fields. And we had our classification of relativistic fields, which were given by this um, J1, J2 representations. So <coughs> we had now discussed the simplest representation, which was the scalar representation. So now following the logic, we should go to the next second simplest representation. And from that, we should construct <coughs> the Dirac spinos. So let us first begin by spin one half. Lorentz representations. the simplest possible Lorentz representation uh, in finite dimensions next to the scalar representation is the one half comma zero representation. We had defined the operators A and B, AI and BI, which were linear combinations of rotations <coughs> and boosts. And in this representation, the AIs are uh, given by the spin one half representation, so they are given by Pauli matrices. Sigma I over two. <coughs> <coughs> and the BIs are zero. Okay, that is the definition of this representation. So what does it mean? The AIs are, um, uh, and the Bs, they determine the angular momentum operators. So Ji is given by Ai plus Bi. So angular momentum operators here are given by Pauli matrix over two. 
the boost operators <coughs> with this index notation j zero i. This is a boost in the direction i. That is also given by some linear combination of a and b, namely <coughs> a i minus b i over <coughs> the complex i. And that is here minus i times the Pauli matrix sigma i over 2. Okay, so this uh, second simplest representation gives you a completely well specified <coughs> um, form for all the um, operators. And it's a two dimensional complex representation. The representation objects, so the objects on which those matrices act, <coughs> they are called spinors. And they are specific spinors, <coughs> namely so called wild spinors. And there is this uh, convention of calling a wild spin or a psi with a lower index alpha. <coughs> if you write down that, then it means a two component spin or alpha. <coughs> oh, sorry, uh, let me drink something. Okay, so alpha runs from one to two. And uh, this notation here means a spinor which transforms exactly in this way. Then there is the zero comma one half representation, which is the opposite. A is zero. <coughs> B is one half Pauli matrices. Then accordingly, J is the same as before, and boost is not the same <coughs> as before because it has changed sign plus i sigma i over two. <coughs> so this representation is also the second simplest possible a finite dimensional representation of the Lorentz group. <clears throat> it also is two dimensional and complex. And the objects are called psi bar alpha dot. Psi bar alpha dot is a <coughs> fixed name for those objects and alpha dot is an index which runs from one to two. And the bar and the alpha dot means exactly this, that this B naught transforms according to this representation of the Lorentz group. It's a strange convention but it's useful and uh, it is common in the literature. <coughs> Okay, these are the two unique simplest, uh, second simplest representations. Now let us form this the direct sum of the two. This is four dimensional <coughs> complex representation. and the <coughs> representation objects have the form, <coughs> I call it now capital Psi. It's a four component object, a four component spinor, and the upper two components <coughs> transform according to the upper representation. The lower two components transform according to the lower representation. 
this is what is meant by a direct sum. So you write your basis vectors on top of each other and form a higher dimensional vector space. So on these objects, we have, again, angular momentum operators, Ji, which are now four by four block matrices, and the upper block is the one from here, and the lower block is the one from there. So they are given <coughs> by the following block matrix, namely sigma i half here, sigma i half there, from here and here. Boost operators, the upper block comes from here, minus i, sigma i over 2, plus i, sigma i over 2. And these are the representation matrices for <clears throat> actually Dirac spinors, even though we have not yet introduced the term Dirac spinors. But because they will be, we give it a special name and a special notation as well. Namely, those objects here are now called S. S rho sigma is defined as this J rho sigma from here. So these are definitions of certain representation matrices for the full Lorentz group, J rho sigma, that's the generic name, but this specific form will now be called S rho sigma, and so this S rho sigma are those specific four by four complex matrices which form a representation of the Lorentz group. Then we automatically get an infinitesimal representation of the Lorentz group. <coughs> Namely, S of lambda. So I will also call it S of lambda. And lambda is now delta plus omega, our usual infinitesimal Lorentz transformation matrix. And this will then be defined as the unit matrix in four dimensions, minus i over two times omega rho sigma times this specific S rho sigma. So we know that uh, this is a representation of the Lorentz group by construction. So now we know how four dimensional spinors defined in the way written at the top, transform under Lorentz transformations, namely in this way. Now we have in principle defined everything, but uh, now we come to something that you know and love and are familiar with, namely the gamma matrices. How do they fit into the picture here? So the gamma matrices are defined generally by the anti-commutation relation gamma mu with gamma nu is equal to two times the metric tensor g mu nu times the unique matrix in four dimensions. And let us write down the gamma matrices in the so-called Weil representation, which fits to these Weil spinors here that we have constructed before. In the Weil representation, gamma zero is defined as the following block matrix. So these are now two by two blocks. So it's an off-diagonal matrix here with a unit two by two and a unit two by two here and zero there. Then the gamma i for the spatial components, they are defined like this. Sigma i here and minus sigma i there. Without one half. And then you can check that this satisfies 
the main definition. So maybe let's look at one particular case. This implies, for example, gamma zero times gamma zero plus gamma zero times gamma zero is two times the unit matrix, okay? Right, because the anti-commutator of gamma zero with itself gives that. Okay, and that simply means the square of the gamma zero matrix must be the unit matrix. So this is something that you can check. It's okay, right? So something, <coughs> something else, gamma zero, gamma one, plus gamma one, gamma zero, what should that be? Zero. It should be zero. And is it zero? If you look at this, do they anti-commute? Actually, yes, because uh, the sign appears once in one corner and in the other case in the other corner, and for that reason, they indeed anti-commute. So that is true, that is true. And so, for example, gamma one, gamma one, plus gamma one, gamma one, what should, what should that be? The anti-commutator of gamma one with itself. It's the square of the gamma one matrix. Yep. It should be minus one, exactly, and here minus two times the unit matrix. And so if you square that, you get minus sigma i square. Sigma i square is the unit two by two matrix, and then you get the minus, so that is also valid. Okay, so in this way, you see that uh, the commutation relations, the gamma matrices must satisfy, is satisfied by this ansatz. So it's a valid ansatz for the gamma matrices, but now let's look at something else. Namely, let us look at the commutator of two gamma matrices in this specific representation. So this calculation is now specific to the while representation. It's not general, but it's specific to a while. So if you do that, gamma i commutator with gamma j, then you get some block matrices. So, uh, okay, maybe let's let's spend one one minute on this. So you get a product gamma i times gamma j that gives you a product of sigma i times sigma j in the diagonal block. So you would get minus sigma i times sigma j uh, from one term and from the opposite order you get plus sigma j times sigma i. That is what appears in the upper left block of the block matrix. And here in these blocks you get zero and in the lower left block you get something similar. Uh, in fact, you get the same, minus sigma i, sigma j, plus sigma j, sigma i. So you get here in the upper block the commutator of two Pauli matrices uh, with a minus in front. And what is this commutator? Pauli matrices satisfy the angular momentum algebra. So that here gives you minus two, <coughs> epsilon i j k sigma k times i. So you can relate that to the original gamma matrices. So by factoring it out, minus two i epsilon I, J, K, gamma, K. Okay, so the commutator here gives you that. Similarly, you can also evaluate the commutator of gamma zero with gamma I. That is of course even simpler. And what you get there is uh, the following, namely two times this matrix sigma i, zero, zero, sigma i, uh, sorry, with minus one. So, and what are those results? 
what are those results? This commutator here gives you a gamma matrix, uh, gamma k, and you should compare that to the angular momentum generator, J. The angular momentum generator also has the, ah, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, that is of course completely wrong. Forget that, please. Uh, I was jumping ahead of myself. Um, this here, sigma k, is just twice the jk, the angular momentum operator with index k. So the commutator of two gamma matrices gives you one of the Lorentz group generators on the space of our Dirac spinors. Namely, it gives you the jk. So commutator gamma 1, gamma 2 gives you j3 up to a prefactor, namely up to the prefactor minus 2. Similarly, uh, the boost generator, where you have in the upper block minus Pauli matrix, in the lower block plus Pauli matrix, you can reconstruct it by taking this commutator here. And so that is a general result. And the general result can be written as follows, namely I over 4 times the commutator gamma mu gamma nu is equal to our Lorentz representation matrix S mu nu that we defined before. Okay. So remember that I gave the special name S to our matrices for boosts and angular momentum operators. And now you see that all of them can be reconstructed by certain commutators of gamma matrices. <coughs> And this is one reason why the gamma matrices are so important, <laughs> because <coughs> they can be used to define uh, the representation matrices for Lorentz transformations on the space of spinors. So let me write some text. Okay, so in while representation we get this identity, but the same relationship here can actually be used <coughs> no matter which representation of gamma matrices you use. And always this output here will give you a representation of the Lorentz group, which is equivalent by unitary transformations to this while representation that we have defined here. Now, let me give you the reason why we actually should combine these two spin one-half representations. Why are we not just happy using one of the two? Why should we add them? The reason is parity symmetry. Please consider the symmetry where x goes to minus x. This is parity symmetry or a space reflection. Under this symmetry, angular momenta are unchanged because the cross product stays the same. Uh, x changes its sign, but the angular momentum does not change its sign. What about boosts? Boosts go into minus boosts because of course if you boost in one direction you flip the sign of space then afterwards you boost in the opposite direction. So therefore 
if you consider the one half comma zero representation and you do a parity reflection symmetry transformation, then it was exactly like this that uh, the zero one half representation had the same sign for angular momentum and the opposite sign for boosts. That means that under parity, this goes into that representation. And so if you want to be able to formulate in your theory a space-time reflection transformation, then you need both of those Bino representations. Only if you say, I do not care about describing space-time reflections, then you could live with just one of the two. But we want to keep this possibility, and of course you know that in electrodynamics uh, the theory is invariant under the symmetry transformation, and if you have that situation then you definitely must use both representations, and then this combination here is the simplest one. So therefore, parity can only be described in the four-dimensional representation. So this motivates now why we do this. And now we finally define what we mean by Dirac spinos. A Dirac spinor is an object psi with four complex components psi 1 to psi 4 with the following Lorentz transformation property psi under lambda goes to S of lambda times psi. with S of lambda from above. And I repeat maybe here, S rho sigma can be defined as I over four times commutator gamma rho gamma sigma. <coughs> this is a Dirac spinor and then a Dirac spinor field is a field psi of x with the following property psi under Lorentz lambda <coughs> goes <coughs> into a new field psi prime with psi prime at lambda x is equal to s of lambda times psi at x. These are Dirac spinors and Dirac spinor fields. Let me write some further properties. and some definitions which are simple and which you already know, I think, from other lectures, so let me just repeat it. Psi bar defined as psi dagger times gamma zero, gamma mu dagger is gamma mu gamma zero gamma mu gamma zero. S rho sigma dagger is S rho sigma multiplied with gamma mu from the left and right because it's constructed from gamma matrices. Then S to the minus one of lambda is infinitesimally one plus I over two omega rho sigma, s rho sigma. And 
that is the same as gamma zero times s of lambda decker times gamma zero. Because if you take s of gamma decker, then uh, the minus i in s of lambda becomes plus i. And uh, if you multiply from the left and right with gamma zero, then s rho sigma decker becomes s rho sigma. So you have this relationship between s of lambda decker and s of lambda to the minus one. Then s to the minus one of lambda times gamma mu times s of lambda. <coughs> this looks like a Lorentz transformation of a gamma matrix. That gives lambda mu nu times gamma nu. That is a not so trivial calculation. Again, best to do it, uh, the proof in infinitesimal form, and then you have to work out a few commutation relations between gammas, because that is composed of two gammas, that is composed of two gammas, that is one gamma. Then you evaluate it infinitesimally and check that the left-hand side becomes equal to the right-hand side. But uh, when you combine all these formulas, then maybe here, you get some very nice relationships for the Lorentz transformations. So under Lorentz, Psi goes to S of lambda Psi. That is the definition. But then Psi bar, Psi bar is defined like this. And you know the relationship between S decker and s to the minus one. So you can easily see that that becomes psi bar times s to the minus one of lambda. So this transforms with s to the minus one. And so if you now do a product of two spinors, psi one bar times psi two, and contract tracked over the Lorentz indices, then you get something which is index free. How does this Lorentz transform? That transforms with s to the minus one and that with s, so this is Lorentz invariant. You can also say such a product of two Dirac spinors is a scalar. Then psi one bar gamma mu psi two under Lorentz, so this transforms to s to the minus one, that with s, and the gamma matrices satisfy this relationship, they transform like a four vector, therefore the whole thing becomes lambda mu nu times that. Okay. So this object here is overall, it's a four vector with four indices, and it indeed transforms as a four vector should transform. This is a, again a non-trivial statement. But this object here, just because you see an index mu, doesn't imply this Lorentz transformation. But uh, using all these relationships, you can prove that it transforms as a, <coughs> as a four vector. So these are all important but simple relationships for spinors and gamma matrices. Have you seen this before? Okay. Now we come to the schedule and to the blueprint that we uh, defined with the help of the scalar field, and we go through the same steps. We want to define a theory with, uh, which depends on such a Dirac field. We want to quantize it and see what happens, because that should be our second simplest kind of a relativistic field theory. So we start with a classical setup, as we did in the case of spin zero. 
So we start with a complex B rox B Nora field. There are no real D rox B Nora fields, they are all complex. So I will stress it only once. And we write down the simplest Lorentz invariant Lagrangian. which is uh, real, of course, or Hermitian, and which has linear equations of motion. And the simplest Lagrangian is already not very simple, but it has the form psi bar, i gamma mu, d mu psi minus m psi bar psi. <clears throat> and so here we make use of this fact that the gamma matrix between psi bar and psi transforms like a four vector. So we can combine it with the four vector derivative and obtain something Lorentz invariant. And here we use the fact that psi bar psi is always Lorentz invariant. So we make use of the four, uh, of the two different types of Lorentz invariant terms that we have just uh, understood. And uh, maybe let's just write it here. Somebody might have this clever idea of doing that. How about this Lagrangian? D mu psi bar, d mu psi. Does this look okay? Actually it does, doesn't it? It looks identical to the case of the scalar field. And it's Lorentz invariant, and actually that's completely right. This is Lorentz invariant. The only reason not to write it here is that it would not be the simplest because this has two derivatives and this has one derivative. In that sense, this is even simpler than this one. And therefore, we focus only on that. And that would give a different theory which we are not interested in. And this, as the simplest Lorentz invariant Lagrangian, gives us the theory that we are interested in. Later in the semester, maybe towards the end of the semester, we might discuss uh, such terms as well. But our motivation to study this and not that at this point is that we strive for the complete set of all theories and therefore we should start with a very, very simplest possible theory and that is this one. It's an additional possibility which is only there for Dirac fields but uh, uh, not for scalar fields. Okay, then let us apply our Pavlov's reflex and just go through all the steps. Euler-Lagrange equation. Let's do it with respect to psi bar. That is easier. If we take the derivative with respect to psi bar, then psi bar does not appear with derivative terms. So the Euler-Lagrange equation is simply zero is dl by d psi bar, as simple as that. And that is just the rest. So let's skip psi bar. Then we have i d slash minus m acting on psi is zero, where of course d slash is an abbreviation for a contraction with gamma mu. <coughs> and that is the beloved Dirac equation. So the form of the equation is the Dirac equation. Then next step, conjugate canonical momenta. So we have pi is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to psi dot. What is the derivative of L with respect to psi dot? Where is psi dot appearing? Who knows it? Yep. Zero. Yep, okay, right, exactly. And what is then the derivative? Uh, psi bar. Yep. 
right? And uh, optionally, you can simplify this or rewrite it anyway as i times psi dagger, because that is uh, given by psi dagger times gamma zero, and gamma zero square is the unit matrix. So you can write the momentum either as this or as that. Then, let's say pi bar, the momentum for psi bar, so we need to take the derivative of L with respect to psi bar dot, but psi bar dot doesn't appear, so this is zero. So what does that mean? In our language of the beginning of the semester, we have two constraints, namely pi bar is identically zero, so that is a constraint, and pi is not zero, but pi is related to a field without time derivative, that is also a constraint. So we have two constraints. And the structure of the constraints is the same as in section 1.2 for the Schrödinger field case, for the non-relativistic Schrödinger field case. So the identical structure of constraints. Um, are these constraints first class or second class constraints? Who remembers what was the definition of first class and second class? So first class corresponds to gauge invariants, second class corresponds to like auxiliary fields, and second class we have if the Poisson bracket between the constraints um, is not zero, and here the Poisson bracket between this and that is definitely non-zero, so we have second class constraints. So we do not have here something like gauge invariance, but we have something like auxiliary variables which could be eliminated by their equations of motion. And uh, so that is the much simpler case, which was also the case in the Schrödinger field. Next step is the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian density given by pi times psi dot minus L, and here we already apply this simple-minded strategy, which is um, motivated by the final result, which is correct. Namely, we, we simply drop this constraint momentum pi bar, which is constrained to be zero. We ignore it in the Legendre transformation and do only the rest. So then we have pi times psi bar minus L. Pi is psi bar i gamma zero, so psi bar i gamma zero times psi dot. That is exactly the same as the derivative term here. So in the difference, it cancels. So the time derivative term just cancels and it completely drops out and everything else remains. So everything else is then minus psi bar i gamma k dk psi. So k runs only from one to three time derivative has dropped out, plus m psi bar psi. And here, this psi bar times i, we can write it as the canonical momentum pi times gamma zero. And in the Legendre transformation, we actually have to do that, so we have to write the result in terms of canonical momenta and the original fields, and so that is what we do here. Then we also have Poisson brackets. Let's just list them. Poisson bracket psi with psi. The arguments are always the same. X and T, Y and T, this Poisson bracket is zero. Poisson bracket of psi with uh, <coughs> pi, that is a three-dimensional delta function between the arguments. And uh, so here we ignore, um, okay, yeah, we, we, we use the constraint that uh, our psi bar 
is already uh, replaced by the canonical momentum pi. So we require that this Poisson bracket is given by what you usually have between psi and pi. And the Poisson bracket of pi with pi is zero. This is basically the set of equations that we also had in the spin zero case. And from those sets of equations, <coughs> we can define the quantum theory. So that defines our classical setup. <coughs> so the next step is the quantum theory. But before going there, and <clears throat> at the end of today's lecture, <coughs> let me write down a few more classical properties, which again you are familiar with from other lectures, but let's summarize them here. Because the Dirac case is of course much more complicated than the Klein-Gordon case, and here in particular you know a lot about the solution of the Dirac equation, and let us collect some of the known solutions. So we have classical, classical means number valued, not operator valued, spinors in momentum space. And so, for example, you can find it also in the Spino script. We choose a momentum p square equal m square. And then consider the 4 by 4 matrix p slash. So what is the property of p slash? First of all, <coughs> p slash square is the same as this. But here you have a symmetric combination, p mu, p nu. So you can replace the gamma matrices by the symmetrized version, which is one half times the anti-commutator of gamma mu and gamma mu. And that is then the metric tensor. So then you have here simply p mu, p nu times g mu nu, which is p square times the unit matrix <coughs> in four dimensions. So the square of the p slash matrix, even though it's a non-trivial four by four matrix, gives you something proportional to the unit matrix. That is good to know. And uh, in particular, it tells you something about the possible eigenvalues. Because whatever p eigenvalue p slash <coughs> has, <coughs> p slash square has only the eigenvalue m square. And so therefore, the eigenvalue of p slash can only be plus minus m because the square of the eigenvalue must be m square. So, and then it's not surprising that in general for m non-zero, we have four linearly independent eigenspinors. With eigenvalues plus minus m. Okay, and so now let's finally give us some names to those eigenvectors. There is the following, p slash minus m, u of p comma s equals zero. So there are the so-called u spinors. They satisfy p slash minus m on u equals zero. That means the u's are eigenspinors of p slash with the eigenvalue plus m. And there are two of them for <coughs> 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 
power s plus minus one half. Then p slash plus m. On v spinors give zero. So the v's are eigenspinors of p slash with eigenvalue minus m. And there are two of them labeled by s equal plus minus one half. <clears throat> this is the first defining property of u and v. Then we use a convention for normalization, namely u of p comma s u bar times u of p comma s prime is equal to <coughs> 2m chronica s s prime. So this is orthogonal and normalized to 2m, so it's dimensionful. Then V bar, V bar V is also orthogonal, but uh, attention please, it's normalized to minus 2m, so it's not positive definite. <coughs> then u dagger ps times u ps prime the same as V decker. That is both positive <coughs> and normalized to the energy 2p0. <coughs> then V decker of sorry V bar P S Q <coughs> P S prime that is also zero, so V and U are orthogonal with a bar. But then there is also an extra relationship V decker times <coughs> if you take the spatial component of the momentum minus P spin S, you multiply it with U of plus P. So the energy is the same, but the spatial <coughs> momentum is different by a sign. Then this is also orthogonal. You can easily prove it by plugging in uh, relations of gamma matrices here. Then we have completeness, uh, and then we will stop. Then we have completeness relations, <coughs> sum over s, u of p comma s times u bar of p comma s for fixed p, but you sum over the two values of s, that gives p slash plus m. Then the same with v, <coughs> gives you p slash minus m. So you can easily check this by applying uh, the left hand side and the right hand side to any spinor. For example, apply it to u of p s prime. Okay. <clears throat> then if you apply this uh, upper line to u of p s prime, then here you get p slash is equal to m. You get 2m as a prefactor. And here you can use the orthogonality conditions and then you see the left hand side and right hand side acts equally on all basis spinos and so you have this equality. Okay, <coughs> let's stop here. Thank you very much. I need to stop. Okay, see you tomorrow.